Hey everyone, Nathan Long here, president of Saybrook University here in beautiful Pasadena, California. Welcome to another episode of Saybrook Insights. About uh, two weeks ago and some change, I was at our annual residential or actually biannual residential learning experience uh, in which our counseling program brought together students from all across the United States for uh, their uh, required connection uh, where they work on in classes, on uh, hours that they get towards their degree, and the closing ceremony. Oh my goodness, it was just powerful. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. It was very beautiful, uh, very affirming, life-affirming. And uh, our guest today, Dr. Dominique Avery, was a critical part of that, along with her other colleagues in the program. Uh, Dr. Avery, who is our guest, uh, started at Saybrook in 2017 and currently serves as the uh, MA Counseling Program Coordinator, along with her recently being promoted to Associate Department Chair. She received her Master's of Counseling and her PhD in Counselor Education at Idaho State University in Meridian, Idaho. Dominique, along with her colleagues, has built a powerful counseling program here at Saybrook that I would contend is one of the top in the nation in terms of the quality, the culture, the approach. It's just really beautiful. Um, and I think it's affirmed by our students uh, and our faculty and how they are just really bonded together in this work. Uh, Dr. Avery's passion for social justice has helped move Saybrook forward also in the justice, equity, diversity, and, and inclusion space. Uh, and it's central as a core to the counseling curriculum. Uh, and I think you'll hear that really uh, thread through our conversation today. I think you're really going to enjoy this interview as much as I did. And for those who are interested in the counseling program, Dr. Avery, uh, I think, is a terrific overview of that culture and that experience. So let's get to it with Dr. Dominique Avery. Dr. Dominique Avery of our counseling program here at Saybrook University. I've been thrilled uh, for the last week or 10 days since you agreed to join us on the podcast here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I'm really happy to talk about a lot of the different things that are happening in the counseling world today. You've got so much going on in that world, so uh, I can't wait to hear more about it. Before we get into all of that, um, I'd like to ask our guests to tell us about you, the Dominique, uh, before Saybrook. What what were some of the formative experiences that you had prior to coming to Saybrook, both maybe personally, what you're willing to share professionally, et cetera? Well, I always like to joke and tell people that I never anticipated being a counselor, much less um, faculty member in higher ed. Ever since I was five, I was going to be a vet. Like there was no DV. No kidding. That. Oh, yeah. I was, uh, I spent my whole childhood like doing work shadows with vets. Um, I rode horses um, as a teenager and, well, kind of middle school for teenage years. And so I, I worked for and I shadowed both large animal vets and um, small animal exotic vets. Um, so I went to college fully thinking I was going to be pre-vet. Wow. Like it was going to, um, I was going to go to UC Davis for vet school. Like it was all planned out, right? Wow. Yeah. And then I uh, started taking sociology and anthropology courses. I'm like, this is kind of cool. Like I could do something with this. Um, and then got into woodland conservation and um, running uh, like w wilderness programs for kids and wow. uh, found I really liked working with the kids and the easiest ones to pull from the school setting to do uh, forest schools, which is when I was over in the, the UK and England, I set up a forest schools program and the kids come into a woodland setting and do wilderness skills, social, emotional, like team building type activities. Um, and I loved it. It was great. It was so much fun working with the kids. And the ones that were easiest to pull from the classroom were the ones with identified kind of social emotional challenges. Um, and so being able to look at the, like what translated for them in the natural setting of going back into the classroom and in their families, like they got so excited. They were bringing their parents out to the woodlands where they were doing some of the work. Some of the kids that hadn't really been connecting with their dads before, like suddenly they were going out into the woods with their dad every weekend. They started having better social, emotional, behavioral um, situations in school. Like they were 
more focused. They were able to stay on task better. Like they were having better peer relationships. I'm like, there's something to this. Like, this is kind of cool working with kids, especially ones that have been identified as having challenges. Yeah. So that kind of got me on the track, um, going in a different direction. I, um, was tapped out the max of what I could do with a bachelor's degree in some of the direct care, um, wellness therapy settings, um, shelter home settings, and was looking for something new, either going into uh, teacher education or social work or counseling. And uh, a teacher's post-bachelor was kind of awkward um, to get the degree and certification. So the program that was accepting applications and was the most interesting was counseling. And I, I ended up there. <laughs> Interesting. So you, you kind of, is it fair to say you fell into counseling initially? Yeah, it was sort of the slow progression of like, animals are cool. Okay, wait, now like the natural world is cool. Hey, there's people in these woods too. Like maybe we should do something with them. <laughs> and it all came together. Like here you are. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then for my graduate degree in counseling, um, they also had a, gra- a PhD in counselor education. And I'm like, I really like teaching and supervising. Um, became evident when I was at the end of my my master's degree. So continued on in there. And then it just was, it was such a great fit. I love what I do. So what was it about counseling when you got, you know, you, I'm sure there was a lot more, you know, kind of evolution in that process for you. What was it that really started to appeal to you then? So like the ins and outs of it uh, that really got you where you are today? Yeah. So one of the things that really appealed to me and where I thought like, oh, I don't really like people. I don't want to work with people. Yes, it is. Was that I'm an introvert and I really value deep, meaningful connections. And that shows up in, in counseling, right? So building those really deep, meaningful connections with people and being able to be part of their growth and um, support them through challenges. Um, also, it's endlessly fascinating. Like everyone is a little like trying to put the little puzzle pieces together, of like what happened and how we came to be and how do we grow and thrive from here? You know, no two days are ever the same, of course. And no two clients I would imagine are ever the same. Yeah. What, what would you say you would, you've learned about yourself as you've grown in the counseling profession that has, surprised you or created a you know a a sense of awareness about like wow this is how i'm showing up or this is this this is interesting about me that i didn't think i or i I didn't know about or or something else that maybe comes to mind for you i think the impact of intergenerational trauma is one of the pieces that really surprised me as most because before coming into counseling i never would have identified like oh, like I have intergenerational trauma in my family. Like there's this really long history, especially with alcoholism and kind of maternal expectations um, and depression and and pieces like that. But there wasn't ever like any one big thing or identified abuse and neglect. Then like, oh yeah, trauma's there. Um, But in understanding trauma and traumatology and going through my own learning as a counselor and a counselor educator, of being able to understand myself better in that sense, and then being able to understand the world of trauma and, and being able to support my clients um, better in that. And that being able to recognize and know what those patterns are from kind of the psychoeducation um, piece of counseling had probably more impact on my growth and like learning about myself um, than going to a counselor. Because I don't think I could have described to anybody like the the causes or sort of the historical patterns that were influencing me. Interesting. So you found through your education that you learned, am I capturing this correctly, that you found more about that or you learn more about yourself and about the intergenerational trauma than you could have ever gotten initially maybe than going to a therapist. Is that kind of what you're driving at? Yeah. And then I think that also mirrors to the understanding of trauma within counseling and how, you know, 10 years ago, trauma was understood and identified in a much different way than it is now. Um, You know, we're really looking for specific events like, you know, 10, 20 years ago versus now there's an understanding of trauma, uh, at least on like the interpersonal kind of systemic oppression level 
of being these like cumulative situational pieces that have historical context um, rather than like, oh, you got a really big, bad car accident or somebody abused you or things like that. So it's a sum total of those experiences in your life and also across generations and the family members and the circle that you your social circles yeah that that's so interesting so fascinating i'd love to dig more into the the area of trauma for just a moment you you noted that that definition has evolved over the last 10 years say yeah i was i've been listening to a number of different uh individuals academicians etc and there's there's this raging debate about trauma or it seems like at least in the things that i'm listening and reading to about is everything it feels like everything is trauma how do we distinguish what is trauma what isn't or is that within our purview to determine i don't know but i'm i'm curious i i know we're getting into territory where we could spend like hours but uh be curious your thoughts on it well, this is actually coming up in, I teach the crisis and trauma interventions course in our, um, our master's program. So our start of the course is the foundations for understanding and conceptualizing what um, trauma-informed care is, as well as what is trauma, what is trauma-focused counseling. And so we look at both from, uh, you know, from the clinical mental health side of things, like what is trauma-informed care? Like what are those really specific concrete pieces in place? But then also from uh, liberation perspectives and uh, relational cultural um, theory, like how are we conceptualizing the source of harm? And if we conceptualize the source of harm, not from like the pathology model of what are the symptoms that show up to somebody who's been traumatized, but from the source of trauma, it's either interpersonal trauma, disaster-based trauma, like something big scale happened, or something individual happened to a person, and also be living in a society in which patriarchy, um, toxic masculinity, oppression, racism, you know, gender oppression, all of these things are constantly present. And so those being a constant source of trauma and being in that soup, right? So being in this kind of background environment in which all these toxic environments are present, um, means that trauma is all around us all the time, unless we really intentionally cultivate spaces that are relational, that are humanistic, that are healing, that offer that alternative kind of counter space to this toxic soup. What does that counter space look and feel like? Or is that defined by each person? And it's a big question too. I mean, we could, again, spend days on that one. But what are your thoughts? Well, I think this um, connects in with what you had recognized um, within our closing ceremonies at the residential learning experience. Uh, we have a an environment in, of people coming in with intentionality of wanting to cultivate connection and growth with each other. And really at the heart of that, believing in the authentic human experience and human dignity and res mutual respect that shows up within that, right? Of the ability to really genuinely care about others and show up as your authentic self, which includes a lot of vulnerability, right? Of like, will I be accepted for who I am? Um, and so creating spaces where people can try that on and make mistakes and do the repair when mistakes happen is, I think, that really the, the counter space to the other pieces. That is so interesting. And you, 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 you know, I was going to go right there because I was just so moved by that. Sarah, I really, it was, it was incredible. Um, for those that, that this is my first time watching a closing ceremony of being part and just being a fly on the wall and watching the, what is it? 150, 160 people in a room together vibing in this space and the diversity in the room, racial, geographical, gender, um, it, you know, it, it was, uh, it, it was powerful, um, to, to watch this mutuality of support, this intentionality around community that you all have cultivated. I really appreciate how you all did that and, and, and brought that together. It seemed like the students had as much 
say in the cultivation of that space that you're creating as did the faculty. It was a, that mutuality of interest and concern around that. Yeah. So I, I think that's another piece that shows up uniquely in our program is that we haven't developed a culture that is hierarchical and power-based between faculty, um, adjunct faculty, doc students, master students, that there's a shared meeting. And one of the terms I really love from uh, for relational cultural therapy is the mutual empathy. Um, and, you know, that speaks to the importance of connection and human growth and being able to show up and the balance of powers doesn't mean there's an absence of like, you know, roles and responsibility. Like that's still there. But being able to to show up and greet people where they are and respect them for humans in the full dignity and genuine, often authentic way that they can be in that moment. That that's a really great way of putting it. I appreciate that. So when we tie this back to, you know, back in twenty seventeen you came to Saybrook University. I remember when you joined us and getting to meet you for the first time. Um how did you find Saybrook? And, you know, you've already alluded to this a little bit, but the connected question is what what was it that was appealing to you about uh, the university and the program especially? I mean, uh, you were coming in, I think, about a year and a half after this program had started. It wasn't accredited. I mean, you had, you know, this online university, right? That was, you know, sort of known in, in certain circles. Uh, so you, you were, and you were coming from a place of, uh, you know, like you could have your pick of institutions. Why say, bro? Well, I actually didn't come into the online program, if you remember. Um, so, yep. So I, um, yeah, I graduated from Idaho State University. Um, so really well connected network of graduates and, um, one of the older counselor education programs, so really well known. Um, and I was geographically specific in my search because I wanted to be closer to family. We had a, a baby um, at the time um, and uh, who's now seven. So she's been through my whole group of Saybrook, right? <laughs> um, and so Saybrook was Seattle-based, right? I mean, like right adjacent to... Um, the family and that's right yep and so the the on the ground in-person program was you know really what i was looking for um and the intensive residential model of that program um was was appealing and it uh i think i credit that intensive residential period of being with a small cohort of students and really getting to know them personally and individually, a lot with shaping who I am as a counselor educator today, um, of being able to to reimagine from a more traditional kind of hierarchical model of education, what it means to have shared collaboration and growth in the learning process um, with a group of students. Um, and then as we shifted into, um, you know, just online education, we're fortunate enough that there'd been enough growth um, in the online program uh, for a space for me to come in. But the not being KCREP accredited, um, I could see the potential in the program and it's really attractive to me to be part of creating something. So that like, you know, what can we create? And in the process of coming in, seeing the support, you know, from you and from the university and the resources dedicated to the program to be able to create what we want to um, and have some of the, the the freedom and academic permissions to do what we want and create something that doesn't show up at anywhere else. That I, I want to see a model that mirrors what we do here. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I'm prone to hyperbole. I'm sure you know that, having worked with me for a while. But I believe our counseling program stacks up as one of the best, if not the best. And when I say best, I'm not like downgrading all the wonderful counseling programs out there, but the combination of faculty, students, and culture that you all have created, it's its special. Maybe maybe best is the wrong word, it, it, but it's truly unique in the, uh, as you said, I, I it, it's really profound, I think, in, in many ways. So 
Uh, I, I was talking to one of your students, soon to be graduates, who's who just said, I finally found not just a home where I'm at, but a, a, a true esprit de corps is what they were alluding to with this co- collective group of counseling students and faculty. So what you have created is really special. And now... You've like been here for six plus years, going on seven soon, and you are now this, uh, you've moved up in the department and you've taken on a, a leadership role. Tell us a little bit about that, why the role was created. Yeah. Um, so our program grew from, my on the ground program had 12 students in it, um, right? And at the time, the online program was in kind of the 30 to 40 range, I think. Um, So starting with this really small program, right? (laughs) And now between adding the PhD in counselor education and supervision and the huge growth that we've had in our master's program, we're right around 200 students between both programs. That's incredible. So looking at the growth in this and the really department the structural pieces of managing and maintaining a K-Corp accredited program. Um, the the intensity of which we have like student contact and kind of tracking our curriculum pieces and um, we're regularly re- reviewing and updating our curriculum. Um, really evident that we need something in addition to department chair and coordinator. So being able to create the associate um, department chair role has been I think just a huge transformation for our program um, where I'm able to dedicate the time and resources within this role to do some of those bigger kind of program structure development pieces alongside um, Jennifer Preston, who's our department chair, and then our um, program coordinators as well. That's terrific. You you're, you all are getting to the point where you could effectively be your own college. I mean, it is that it's getting to that size. and um, And what's great is you're still cultivating that sense of intimacy within the community in the sense of of really that bondedness amongst the students. I know it's harder and harder to cultivate as we get larger, but um, it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful problem to have um, or challenge, I should say. Yeah. Opportunity. Yeah. What's the right word? Yeah. (laughs) Right. Well, this, this fall RLE was the first time that we were all back in person um, since before the pandemic. So we've been offering both virtual and on the ground um, options and in hybrid and separate. And then we weren't quite sure how it was going to go. Um, and we have, we had such investment from our students and showing up and being present and valuing the time together. Um, it was wonderful to see kind of post pandemic, how everybody coming together, some folks who had only ever met in the virtual space and coming into the shared embodiment of being in each other's physical space um, was just incredible. And um, and I think showed up in that closing ceremony that we saw people really value the interpersonal connection. And then it translates to the rest of the online time in our synchronous and asynchronous classes together that people are talking to somebody they actually have a relationship with. It's not just a name and a picture on the screen. But like, oh, yeah, you know, you had lunch together and you hung out and, you know, each other's pets names. And, you know, that's what <laughs> it makes a difference. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah that's right. Well, it, it, you know, so the counseling program, you all have taken a it, it was a bit of a trial balloon run, right? It, with the uh, group interviewing that you do with new students and um, it seems like you've been able to translate from there from that that process uh the cultivation further cultivation because i this this cultivation was predating this this innovation and the admissions approach what have you found as part of this group interviewing approach that has been both a perhaps a challenge but also a benefit to the program as you've built it and and maybe some of the outcomes that you're starting to see uh, across the board I think it gives students an opportunity to get a taste of what it's going to be like to be in the program. So they get a chance to have a discussion with each other. They get a chance to ask questions of the faculty, to meet more than just one or two people that they're interviewing with, but really to get a chance to interview us as well. And we're seeing greater student retention from admissions process to coming into the program um, because they 
I think folks can imagine what it's going to look like and they can see themselves there. And, you know, as we've um, further diversified our faculty and, um, you know, doing things like including our pronouns and our our um, Zoom tags and kind of talking about what the culture is and who our student body and our faculty are within it. Um, you know, I've heard from students that they can see themselves present, um, that, you know, they saw everybody shared their pronouns and they knew that this was going to be a safe space for someone who is transgender or gender diverse. Um, so being able to have that sense of like, what is this actually going to be like um, is a huge piece, especially for students coming into a lesser known online university, right? Like you're a real place, right? <laughs> like, yes, we are a real place. <laughs> and it's, and so I've heard from students too, that just that structure of the type of communication that we send out, as well as the connection during that group experience um, really helps to translate their faith that this is going to be a good place for them to learn and grow. That's right. Amen to that. Very briefly, because we're coming to the conclusion of our time, but and and we, I probably should have gotten to this earlier because it's so central to everything that we do at the university. But um, you've been, uh, you were integral, and I, I think for our audience to know, Dominique, Dr. Avery has been uh, just a really great uh, asset to our Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Council. You were so fundamental in getting us to where we are today and the work that we're embarking on um, and your passion around social justice issues is really, really, you know, just so powerful. Can you just very briefly discuss why these are so, so central to so much of your work that you do? And I know we're giving it short shrift, but we'll, we'll, we'll expand on this later for sure. Well, I think it ties into what we've already discussed of, you know, understanding the, the soup of trauma that we're existing in in, in our society. Um, and with that, the perspective that I take in um, anti-racism and social justice um, work is that it's liberty for all or liberation for all without losing track that we're striving to really serve those who are the purpose from justice those who have multiple marginalized identities, right? And so if we're working on really shifting these larger scale systemic oppressive systems, then we're also improving conditions and creating healthy communities and um, environments for everybody who's in them as well. So it's, it's not something that, you know, you opt in because you hold a certain identity, but it's, it's work that all of us need to engage in. Well done. I mean, for a nutshell explanation, that was very, very packed. Thank you for that. I can expand the elevator speech to as long as we want to talk. But Well, that elevator speech, I wish I had a, a better way of doing it myself. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. So as we conclude today, I ask all of our guests two key questions um, for, for us, at, and they're really quick takes. So it, it doesn't have to be the A plus answer that that comes out of the textbook, but I I am assured, given everything you said today, that uh, we're going to learn a lot from you on these two items. Um, the first is, what does the term humanistic mean to you? I'm going to give a shout out to our Association for Humanistic Counseling um, with this one. Um, so I've been uh, a part of one of their interest networks that is cultural humility and dignity. And I think that captures the humanistic presence more than anything else that I've seen, that we're really looking at the, the source of how can I be an authentic cultural being and be in a genuine relationship with somebody else that invites curiosity into who they genuinely are. And it's that both internal awareness and presence, both the interpersonal um, connection with others and the community that we create as a result of that. So it's the sort of like multi-tiered um, piece that all needs to be present to really have the humanistic mission um, operationalized and embodied in the work that we do. A very holistic approach to that response, which is very much in line with the humanistic philosophy. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so the last question, um, before we say our goodbyes, uh, would be, yeah, what are three things that an individual 
who's listening right now can do to improve or enhance their mental and or emotional well-being? Thinking of my my seven-year-old is so invested in the importance of kindness and being kind to yourself and being kind to others, I think has to be the heart of everything that we do. Um, and so learning a lot from, from our kids and just what that, what those core pieces of being a good human are about. Um, I think the other one is engaging with others in your community of being able to connect and share um, mutual experiences that create healthy communities um, and finding your joy, um, having things that that spark an interest to you. And it doesn't matter how geeky or how weird they are. It's, you know, if they, they bring you joy, that's all that matters. No, ma- I, I have to write that down, no matter how geeky. I love that. Oh, yeah. I'm a big garden geek. And so I have others who understand my garden geekiness because my heart would be a lot. <laughs> Does he call you a nerd or a geek? I'm on a specific garden group that has like its own notification toad. And every time that goes off, he just rolls his eyes. He's like, now what? That is, that is deliciously geeky. I think that is fabulous. Now, now I need to hear the tone at some point. So you're going to have to like, uh, cue me in on that one. That's terrific. Well, Dr. Avery, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule. Uh, thank you for being here today. Where can people find you on the web? Anywhere in particular or just go to Saybrook? What's your... Saybrook's the best thing. I don't have a separate personal professional presence other than the association work and leadership that I do, which is mostly with the American Mental Health Counseling Association and with my state chapter of Washington Mental Health Counselors. Fabulous. All right. Well, thank you. So you can find Dr. Avery at saybrook.edu. Look her up on the faculty uh, directory and you can learn all about her. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Long. Oh boy. I really appreciated uh, Dr. Avery today. I hope you did as well. Remember her three major takeaways. These were terrific. Kindness. I, I really be kind to yourself and to others. Uh, really focus in on that. Engage with others in your community. Connect and share. Find those connection points around you know, the things of interest, the things that uh, bring joy uh, and that bond people together and find your joy, no matter how geeky. I think in Dr. Avery's case, she's a gardener. Uh, I won't get into my thing, but it uh, always fun to find your 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 mojo in whatever it is uh, that uh, brings you joy. If you want to see the YouTube version, please visit our Saybrook YouTube page. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to Apple iTunes, leave that five-star rating and review, and subscribe so you can get episodes as they come out. If you're on Spotify, leave the five-star rating and make sure to follow us. You can, of course, subscribe to us on most major podcast platforms, including Google, Stitcher, Pandora, Pocket Cast, Amazon, and so many others. Remember to check our show notes for information on Dr. Avery, including links to websites, books, and the like. And for more about our university, go to www.saybrook.edu. Click on Areas of Study at the top of the page and locate the program of your choice to learn more. And in this case, the counseling program. Remember, we have a master's in counseling and a PhD in counseling uh, or counselor education and supervision, I should say. And both are professionally accredited by KCREP or simply Google Saybrook University. That's it for today, folks. Thanks so much. Take care and be well.